It's 1969, and even though the Vietnam War continues to rage, things are about to change. President Nixon is now in the White House, and with violent anti-war protests at home and discipline problems on U.S. bases, he promises to withdraw American troops from the Vietnam quagmire. But that doesn't mean an end to the fighting. As U.S. troop numbers drop, the war expands across borders and in the air as more weapons are pumped into the South. Even so, as the final U.S. troops leave, South Vietnam's existence is on a razor's edge, and Nixon knows it. In 1968, the Vietnam War reaches its bloody climax for the U.S. As they combat the North Vietnamese Tet Offensive and its follow-up attacks throughout the year, they suffer around 100,000 casualties. But dramatic events also take place on the U.S. home front, as political assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy and violent protests grab headlines. The division on the streets is mirrored in the White House. President Lyndon B. Johnson has lost much of the support of his own party and refuses to campaign for a second term. Instead, he distances himself from former advisors and party opposition. His vice president, Hubert Humphrey, leads a faction critical of his Vietnam policies, and both Democrats and Republicans see de-escalation in Vietnam as key to electoral success. Johnson has overseen a shift in Vietnam policy. He replaces General William Westmoreland, U.S. commander in Vietnam since 1965, with General Creighton Abrams. Throughout late 1968, Abrams keeps up offensive pressure on the North Vietnamese with operations like Tuan Tang Tu, which the U.S. claims kills 25,000 enemy troops. However, Abrams also emphasizes pacification, defections, and selectively targeting Viet Cong figures over big offensives. Despite the changes, the Democrats are down in the polls. Meanwhile, Republican candidate Richard Nixon says that he wants, quote, peace with honor in Vietnam, but leaves the details deliberately vague. First priority foreign policy objective of our next administration will to be bring an honorable end to the war in Vietnam. By October, Nixon has a clear advantage over Humphrey in the coming election. Despite the differences between Johnson and Humphrey, the president helps Humphrey's chances with an announcement. As a result of all of these developments, I have now ordered that all air, naval, and artillery bombardment of North Vietnam cease as of 8 a.m. Washington time, Friday morning. After three years and 50,000 North Vietnamese deaths, the U.S. will stop bombing North Vietnam and open negotiations with the North and South Vietnamese governments. The Democrats receive a potentially decisive boost, but it doesn't last. Nixon's team are in secret contact with South Vietnam President Nguyen Phan Thu and promise him more support under a Republican U.S. government if he sabotages the Democrats' plan. Just before the voting starts, Thieu rejects Johnson's deal, calling off meaningful negotiations and undermining Humphrey. On November 5th, Nixon wins the closely contested election, and the Republicans now head the U.S. war effort. Nixon's priorities in 1969 are to end the U.S. commitment in Vietnam and stabilize the international Cold War. However, abandoning South Vietnam would endanger U.S. global prestige, so Nixon plans to de-escalate and escalate in different areas. Firstly, he will withdraw U.S. troops to reduce losses. Pacification will continue, while the South Vietnamese Arvin will do most of the fighting, a policy known as Vietnamization. The U.S. will pressure North Vietnam to negotiate and accept U.S. demands for Northern troops to leave the South. For this, Nixon will rely on international political isolation and threats of overwhelming force. Nixon develops the madman theory, which plays on his well-known reputation as a fiery anti-communist. Using overt, even nuclear threats, he hopes to coerce North Vietnam as he confides to an aide. I want the North Vietnamese to believe I've reached the point where I might do anything to stop the war. We'll slip the word to them that, for God's sake, you know Nixon is obsessed about communism. We can't restrain him when he's angry. And he has his hand on the nuclear button and Ho Chi Minh himself will be in Paris in two days begging for peace. 
Nixon will use air power to send his message, and he secretly bombs North Vietnamese depots and infrastructure in neighboring Cambodia. Henry Kissinger supports Nixon's approach. Both share a realpolitik theory and a preference for direct individual action. Kissinger develops plans for massive bombing of North Vietnam, but also makes it clear to Nixon coercion, not military victory, is the goal. In Saigon, the tendency is to fight the war to victory. It has to be kept in mind, but you and I know it won't happen. It's impossible. Even General Abrams agreed. And pressure is mounting in North Vietnam. Some leaders call for negotiations too, but militant leaders like Le Duan believe more military victories are essential to earning a good deal. However, the Tet Offensive costs the North dearly. North Vietnamese leaders estimate it will be three years before they can mount another offensive. For North Vietnamese civilians and soldiers, some of whom have been fighting for over 10 years, the high casualties and long war are taking a toll. It began to seem like an open pit. There was even a kind of motto that the whole generation of army-age North Vietnamese adopted. They tattooed it on themselves and they sang songs about it. Born in the North, to die in the South. The death of North Vietnamese founder Ho Chi Minh on September 2, 1969 is an additional blow, although he had stepped back from power years earlier. Meanwhile, Nixon's policies are having an effect. A slow but steady US troop withdrawal is underway, from 475,000 in 1969 to 334,000 in 1970. This, along with reforming the draft system, boosts his popularity and decreases protests. Behind the scenes, Nixon encourages the CIA, FBI, and IRS to covertly monitor anti-war movements and opponents. As US troops withdraw, the Arvin takes up more responsibility in defense. In fact, by 1970, the South Vietnamese army is one of the strongest and best equipped in the world, at least on paper. Under Nixon, Arvin expands to 1 million men by 1971. Whereas previously they had surplus World War II equipment, they're now equipped to US standards, including over 1 million M16s and M60 machine guns. Their air force becomes the fourth largest in the world, with more than 2,000 aircraft, mostly Huey helicopters, but also attack aircraft like the A-1 Sky Raider and A-37 Dragonfly. But Arvin struggles to translate this material strength into strategic potential. It remains incredibly corrupt, with some officers filling their units with fake ghost soldiers to draw extra pay. There's also little technical knowledge for the new equipment, while the expansion of the armed forces also impacts the South Vietnamese economy, which is already buckling under a refugee crisis. Soldiers' low pay, around $18 a month in 1970, contributes to around 120,000 Arvin troops deserting each year. Arvin soldiers also struggle with a crisis of morale. Most of the South Vietnamese soldiers knew that some members of their family were on the other side. When you shoot into an area, maybe your own blood brother is there. And fighting against communism, what is that? Nobody understood. They knew they were fighting against other Vietnamese, and other Vietnamese were fighting against foreigners. So in our hearts, we had sympathy for the other side. Still, Vietnamization is popular in the US, and in early 1970, the Arvin is put to the test. In neighboring Cambodia, pro-US General Lon Nol launches a coup against Prince Norodom Sihanouk. Sihanouk was officially neutral in the Vietnam War, but did not prevent North Vietnamese forces establishing bases in border regions. On April 30th, 1970, at the apparent invitation of Lon Nol, 80,000 Arvin and US troops move into Cambodia to wipe out communist bases, including the elusive Central Office for South Vietnam, the so-called Bamboo Pentagon. The operation, which is joined by Lon Nol's Cambodian forces, is partially successful, with large amounts of weaponry captured. However, the Viet Cong avoid major combat and withdraw further into Cambodia, taking the Central Office for South Vietnam with them. The US Arvin attack fails to capture any major headquarters and has unintended consequences. Firstly, it pushes North Vietnamese forces into a closer relationship with Cambodian communists of the Khmer Rouge, with devastating long-term consequences for Cambodia. Secondly, it reignites public opposition to the war in the US, culminating in mass protests on college campuses. At Kent State and Jackson State Universities, National Guard troops fire on protesters, killing six and wounding 21. 
In November, Nixon addresses the nation, asking the so-called silent majority not protesting the war to unite behind him. Overall, his approval rates are still high, with 59% supporting him according to some polls. But there is dissent within the government and the Senate. Nixon excluded key figures from planning for Cambodia, and senators from both parties attempt to force an end to the incursion through Congress. Senator George McGovern gives an emotional address. Every senator in this chamber is partly responsible for sending 50,000 young Americans to an early grave. This chamber reeks of blood. The amendment fails to pass, and Nixon and Kissinger react by increasing covert surveillance of opposition and critical colleagues, and further centralizing decision-making into Kissinger's National Security Council. But dissent and disenchantment are not limited to the U.S. home front. In Vietnam, the discipline, combat efficiency, and morale of U.S. troops also suffers. Although Arvin is doing more fighting, U.S. troops are still seeing combat. But now that it's clear U.S. troops will be withdrawn, there's little motivation for them to fight and die in Vietnam. In some cases, a lack of direction leads to indiscipline. Desertions, especially troops on leave, increase to 70 out of 1,000 soldiers. For many soldiers, it becomes harder to justify the loss of a comrade. I saw my buddy shot beside me. That's what made me desert. I could think of no good reason why he should die, why I should die, why any GIs should die in Vietnam. To avoid casualties, some units conduct so-called search and evade missions. They find safe areas and make falsified reports or deliberately avoid contact with the enemy. As the number of U.S. troops decreases, those who remain lack purpose, and drug use soars. By 1973, the Pentagon estimates 35% of enlisted men try heroin, with 20% addicted during their tour. The men often use alcohol, marijuana, and LSD, although usually away from the front line. However, some soldiers use the methamphetamines or cocaine to stay alert while on operations. General Abrams is frustrated. I've got white shirts all over the place. Psychologists, drug counselors, detox specialists, rehab people. Is this a goddamn army or a mental hospital? Officers are afraid to lead their men into battle, and the men won't follow. Jesus Christ, what happened? Some US troops even turn to fragging, deliberately targeting their own officers with fragmentation grenades. Officers may be fragged for several reasons, like ordering dangerous missions or attempting to limit drug use, and the Department of Defense records 788 incidents between 1969 and 1972, with 86 deaths. Others suggest the death toll may be much higher, especially when mysterious deaths in the field are taken into account. Some estimates run as high as 1,000 U.S. officers and NCOs killed in fragging and shooting incidents, but the exact amount will likely remain unknown. Political and social divisions in the U.S. are also replicated in Vietnam. Commanders vigorously suppress troops' anti-war protests, but racial tensions are harder to control. Although soldiers of all races describe unity in battle, friction boils over on bases. This is especially true after the assassination of Martin Luther King, who was a vocal critic of the war. We are taking young black men and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. So we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. Following his death, American troops riot on U.S. bases in Vietnam. Back in the U.S., some Vietnam veterans are prominent in the protest movement. By 1971, 20,000 have joined Vietnam Veterans Against the War, including future Secretary of State John Kerry. Someone has to die so that President Nixon won't be, and these are his words, the first president to lose a war. We're asking Americans to think about that, because how do you ask a man to be the last man to die in Vietnam? How do you ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? 
By early 1971, the war seems to have been fully Vietnamized. U.S. troop levels are at 157,000, and some U.S. officials claim pacification and targeting North Vietnamese agents in the South is having an impact. In February, commanders send Arvin across the border into Laos in a preemptive attack. Operation Lamson 719 aims to capture a North Vietnamese supply depot at Chipon and disrupt North Vietnamese offensives. Congressional limits mean Nixon cannot send U.S. ground troops, although aircraft will provide support. But after modest gains, the North Vietnamese army counterattacks the 15,000-strong Arvin force. President Thieu orders a withdrawal, triggering a chaotic route back into Vietnam. Arvin losses are up to 8,000 casualties, with 150 vehicles abandoned, including tanks. The defeat is underscored by ongoing domestic troubles in the U.S. In March, U.S. courts sentenced Lt. William Calley to life imprisonment for his role in the 1968 My Lai Massacre, in which U.S. troops deliberately murdered around 500 South Vietnamese civilians, including 173 children. Opinion in the U.S. is divided, with one poll showing 65% of respondents are not upset by Cali's actions. Three days after the conviction, Nixon orders Cali into house arrest, and he's released in 1974. Next, in June 1971, disgruntled Department of Defense official Daniel Ellsberg leaks a bombshell 7,000-page document called the Pentagon Papers to the media. It outlines chaotic U.S. decision-making in Vietnam and concludes they were influenced more by domestic political interests than military or political realities in Vietnam. The result is a decline in the U.S. public support for the war and for the South Vietnamese government. A poll in mid-1971 shows 58% of Americans now believe the war is morally wrong, while 60% favor withdrawal even if it leads to a South Vietnamese collapse. So Nixon and Kissinger revive negotiations with the North. They still demand North Vietnam removes troops from the South, but their priority is now the release of American prisoners. Hanoi demands an end to U.S. bombing and support for Thieu. Nixon attempts to isolate North Vietnam politically by appealing to their allies, including a breakthrough diplomatic mission to China in February 1972. However, he comes away disappointed, since China and the Soviet Union have only limited influence over North Vietnam. The North now feels another offensive could bolster their bargaining power. On March 30, 1972, they launch the Easter Offensive, with 122,000 NVA troops attacking into the South from the North, Cambodia and Laos. Now equipped with Soviet and Chinese artillery and tanks, including T-54s, the attacks make early progress against Arvin, securing all of Quang Tri province. Their new equipment makes a powerful impact. Any exaggerations? Or no, sir. Uh, I'd like to go back to the night of May the 10th, sir, and it's been estimated we took 7,800 rounds of uh, different caliber indirect fire weapons. That's a good number, sir. We took at least that many. The prep lasted for approximately 10 hours, sir. It started at uh, 1800 in the afternoon, and it lasted till 0400 in the morning. The first six hours of the attack was artillery, 105 and 155. Uh, then the mortar started in. I, I wouldn't even want to guess how many mortar tubes were around, but it was just so intense that it's unbelievable, sir. Arvin hold out in some locations, but it's U.S. air power, including B-52s and Cobra gunships, which largely stopped the offensive. Even so, North Vietnam keeps some gains. Nixon now becomes highly critical of General Abrams' command and pursues negotiations with renewed urgency. A fresh U.S. election is looming, and with only 24,000 U.S. troops remaining in Vietnam, Nixon is eager to finish the withdrawal and sign a deal. There are two stumbling blocks in the negotiations. The North wants President Thieu removed from power, and the U.S. wants North Vietnamese troops out of South Vietnam. Privately, however, Nixon and Kissinger prioritize U.S. voters' concerns, like the return of POWs. To maintain its global reputation, Kissinger writes the U.S. simply needs a decent interval between U.S. withdrawal and the South's seemingly inevitable collapse. We are ready to withdraw all of our forces by a fixed date and let objective realities shape the political future. We want a decent interval. There is debate about whether the decent interval was official policy, but many senior U.S. officials understand the South's chances of long-term survival are poor. 
In October, both sides compromise, although the US gives up more. The North agrees to release US prisoners and cooperate with Thieu within a National Council of Reconciliation, while in exchange, the US will withdraw all its troops and recognize the political legitimacy of the Provisional Revolutionary Government, the political wing of the Viet Cong. Decisively, the North will not have to withdraw its military from the South. However, President Thieu rejects the deal. Nixon is outraged, although at least one National Security Council staffer notices an irony. After having said for years that South Vietnam was a sovereign, independent government, we now resented it for acting that way by opposing what was, from their point of view, a poor agreement. Nixon, now backed up by an electoral victory, tries to renegotiate with the North in November, but they refuse. So Nixon resorts to force to break the deadlock, ordering Operation Linebacker 2. From December 18th to 29th, US bombers dropped 36,000 tons of bombs on North Vietnam, including Hanoi and Haiphong. That's more than the entire total dropped from 1969 to 71. The attacks killed 2,000 civilians in Hanoi alone, and the North reopens negotiations on December 27th. Historians have debated whether this was really due to the bombing, the damage of which was relatively light thanks to wartime evacuation. The attack also cost the US 27 aircraft to North Vietnamese air defenses. Some historians suggest Thieu had already agreed to return to negotiations before the bombing, and the real intention was to show US strength to China and the Soviet Union. US and international media are generally critical of the attack, with the New York Times calling it, quote, war by tantrum. When negotiations resume on January 8, 1973, a conclusion comes surprisingly quickly. But the New Deal only differs cosmetically from the October Agreement. Importantly, the final Paris Peace Accords signed on January 27 stipulate the North can still maintain forces in the South, and the US will withdraw within 60 days. In those final weeks, the US continues to pump military equipment into the South, and Nixon reassures Thieu if the North attacks, the US will return. By March 30, 1973, the final contingent of 5,200 US troops leaves Vietnam for good. American involvement in the Vietnam War has come to an end, and South Vietnam stands alone. When I travel from home in Vienna to the Real-Time History Studio in Berlin, the night train passes through multiple countries and that can be a headache. Suddenly every website assumes that I speak Czech or Polish, or I can't even access it because it's blocked in the EU outright because they don't want to comply with privacy laws. With a VPN like NordVPN, this is a thing of the past, and I can still access geo-blocked content and business files. And NordVPN is fast enough that you can easily and safely stream movies or previews of our upcoming videos too. Once I'm at my destination and need to access a public Wi-Fi, NordVPN protects my traffic from others snooping around on the same network. And all that works both on my laptop and on my smartphone. It's super easy to set up and use in your daily online life. If you go to nordvpn.com slash realtime history, you can get a two year plan plus four additional months with a huge discount. It's risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee and it supports our channel. That's nordvpn.com slash realtime history. We would like to thank NordVPN for sponsoring this episode. As usual, you can find all the sources for the episode in the video description below. Don't forget to check out our previous videos about Indochina and the Vietnam War. If you're watching this video on Patreon or Nebula, thank you so much for the support. We couldn't do it without you. I'm Jesse Alexander, and this is a production of Real Time History, the only history channel that also occasionally gets mistaken for a mental hospital. Oh, did I get that in before that? <laughs> Actually, with sirens talking about a mental hospital, <laughs> it, it might be a, a bonus. Yeah. So keep the sirens in if they're there, guys. <laughs>